when we turn to Psalm 51. What verse do we usually go to? Okay. Verse number five. You know why we do that? Why? Okay. Okay. That's what we usually do. People turn to it because it supports their version of you are born in sin. Right. Right. Were we born sinners? No. In fact, the King James Version, the American Standard Version, and the New King James Version all relate the fact that uh, we are born in a sinful world, but it doesn't say we're born sinners. As a matter of fact, there are other verses we go to. That's what I'm going to talk about tonight, today, this morning. <laughs> Rather, I'm going to actually look at the psalm itself. And, uh, and what, is, what is David trying to relate? As we see that the, in the heading of this Psalm 51, it says, To the chief musician, the psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone, to, gone into Bathsheba. Okay, so David had sinned, a grievous sin, and thought he could hide it. In fact, it led him to a greater sin in murdering, uh, organizing the murder of, of uh, Bathsheba's husband. And uh, Nathan the prophet was sent by God and revealed to David that, that God knew exactly what he had done and that he's not fooling anybody, that he's fool, he wasn't fooling God at all. And of course, David responding in, in the appropriate fashion and in repentance. Okay? And this is a psalm that, that is believed that he wrote in, in expressing his repentance. And it's... Uh, many of the psalms capture or reveal to us of the kind of, of uh, you know, we are adopted sons of God, whereby we're not, we don't have the, the spirit of, of, uh, of uh, bonds, bondage, where, but we have the, the spirit of adoption as sons, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, an intimate relationship between Christians and the Father. Okay. And the Psalms teach us what it means to be intimate with God. How it is we are intimate with God. And this psalm, I think, is one of the most intimate, that most revealing of a man that bears his soul to the, to, to the Father in expressing his, his remorse for what he had done against. And as, as we'll go through some of these verses. And I'm, I'm, this is a study of the contrite heart. What does it mean to have a contrite heart? You know, we, 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 we preach the plan of salvation, you know, hearing the word, believing, uh, confessing Christ, repenting of sins, and being baptized for remission of sins. But repentance of sins, what does that involve? Of course, we know that's, that's remorse that, that we have sinned against God, but also it's a change of mind. We know that. But as to what, uh, what does remorse for from, from sin involve? I mean, to how deeply should we feel sorry? I and mean, that's, that's what I'm getting at. As, so let's look, at, let's look at some of the verses in Psalm 51. He says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. If God is, a, is faithful to forgive us of our sins as we confess our sins to him, you know, 1 John uh, uh, tells us that God is faithful to forgive us. And David was familiar with the mercies of God and being in forgiving him of when one uh, confesses his sins to him. He sa says, wash me throughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from, mine, from my sin. As we consider our own sins, we have a memory of it. We have a memory of what we've done. And sometimes we can do things that will affect us for the rest of our lives. There are, there are consequences to sin, and sometimes the consequences of sin are lifelong. Okay. Sometimes it leaves an emotional scar on us, too. Okay, that, that, and what I have done, not only t against God, but also it's against others, what, how I've harmed them. And sometimes it affects us that how could I have done this? And you just carry that weight around with you all your, all your life. Not that God has, doesn't forgive us. Not that, that's, not, that's not what I'm saying. God is faithful to forgive us. And uh, we are justified because of the blood of Christ. But yet we, we can carry around that, that memory of what we have done. And so David is, cry, is calling to God to wash me throughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my, from my sin. So God does cleanse us. You know, when, when Ananias uh, uh, told Paul, and why tarry us now 
Arise, be baptized, wash away thy sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. So God does wash of our, of our sins. He makes us as though we were white as snow because the blood of Christ cleanses us. Uh, that's the depth and uh, extent that Christ's blood will cover our sins. So, so as, as uh, David writes here, wash me throughly, wash me thoroughly, okay, completely. In verse 3, 4, I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. I acknowledge my transgressions. He's confessing his sins. Okay, he's, he's, he's bearing it all. He's being honest. He's being forthright with God. That's how we should all be. We should never think we can deceive the Father. As a matter of fact, we, um, it, it's, it's uh, how foolish it is. Yeah. Ananias and Sapphira, when they, when they came to uh, the apostles, presented the funds they'd got from the sale of their property, it was only a portion of it, which was in their power. It was not an issue that they had, had presented, just a portion of their funds. But they had lied to them, saying that this was the entire amount. As Amos said, they were trying to deceive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit knew. The Father knew. And because they knew, therefore Peter knew. And, and so the idea that how, could, how do, do we really think we can deceive the Father? Do we really think we can hide sin from Him? As we live our lives day to day, uh, uh, you know, there are those who went through the motions, whether it be sincere at the time or not, they went through the motions and some who actually received forgiveness of sins and obedience to the gospel. Or those who just went through the motions, and of course God knows their hearts. Okay. At any rate, there are those that at some point will begin to live a lie. Okay. They think that by putting up a front, putting up a facade, this, and, and that this is the way they appear on Sunday mornings when they're in front of everybody, when they come to meet and worship, right? But on the other days of the week, they just aren't living the Christian life or they don't have the commitment uh, that, the, that Christ demands of them, you know. And, and so they think that, that uh, as long as everybody else doesn't know the truth about my life, that everything's just fine. You know, but, but it's clear that, you know, we can't hide from God. He sees all. He knows all. And as we see here, David acknowledged his transgressions. Interesting that he would say his sin is ever before him. As, as the committing of his sin, and as he saw the results of his sin day by day, as that, that, that day of delivery came, as the nine months came, his sin was ever before him. Okay, And so he, it was a reminder to him that what he had done and all that he was involved with as Bathsheba was coming uh, closer to term. Uh, but his sin, and of course in his mind, playing it over and over again perhaps, it was always on his mind. So as he was confessing his transgression to the Father, and he made, he, he made it clear, yeah, it bothers me. It's ever before me. Okay. In ver verse 4, and he, he relates the significance of what he had done. Did he sin against Bathsheba? Committing adultery, yes, he did. Did he sin against uh, Uriah, her husband? Yeah, not only in the, in the adultery, but also in having him murdered. So he, he did sin against Uriah. Um, he sinned against himself, too. Um, but then look at verse 4, against thee, talking to the Father, against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. So when he says against thee and thee only have I sinned, what does he mean? Does he mean he only sinned against God in, in, in that sin? What does he mean? He what? Even against God? Okay, he did. The significance, I think, he's placing it 
as badly as I sinned against Bathsheba and Uriah, myself and everybody else involved, yes, he involved others in murdering Uriah too, so he sinned against them too. His own officers, he sent the, the, the note to. Uriah delivered that death note to his superiors. And his superiors were now involved with this scheme to murder Uriah. Okay, So he, David sinned against these, his officers too. Okay, so, but now he, he relates uh, that amongst all of them against whom he sinned, the father was most grievous. Well, it's, that's, it's from God where he even knows that this is wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, God is the one who has declared that this is... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The law has told me That's right. This isn't what I've done is wrong. Yeah. So yeah, as the law came from God, making clear to us what the sin, what sin was, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, in the sense thou shalt not murder, as Jesus said. Um, and so he had committed these things, and the law came coming from God. Now he, having transgressed that very law that God had given him, the grief, you know, he had grieved God probably greater than anyone else. At, at any rate, he does make it clear. He, it's like hyperbole. He says, you're the only one I've really sinned against. But, but and he's not saying that. He's saying, I've really grieved you okay, and done this evil in thy sight. That thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Okay. Okay. In verse five, behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. He, he conf here he's saying, you know, I was born in a world full of sin. In sin did my mother conceive me. Does it say that she sinned when he she was con conceived, David? Adam. Okay. Okay. What Adam's making reference to is, is uh, remember Tamar, that what she what she did to per, uh, preserve the bloodline of her original husband. And there's the law of Moses that uh, when a man dies without having progeny, without having children, the wife has the right to marry or actually his brother has the obligation to, to uh, conceive with his, uh, his widow. I'm getting confused. I'm, I'm trying to make it clear. Yeah, the man, a man dies leaving a widow who has no child. So that man that died, his brother has the obligation to conceive with his widow that to carry on the bloodline of him that had no children. Okay. And as in the case of Tamar, she was a widow, and she went to her father-in-law, Judah, I think it was, to uh, continue this blood, to, to, to claim that right that her brother-in-law would when he became of age, would uh, fulfill that obligation. Well, her, her brother-in-law came of age, didn't fulfill the obligation, and so time just kept on passing, so she approached Judah again. Said, oh, hey, what's going on? Well, it fell upon Judah to fulfill it, but he did not. He, he uh, uh, backed away from his responsibility. So Tamar takes things into her own hands, goes out on the wayside, dresses as a harlot, waits around and Judah comes around and so she, she uh, engages him in that fashion to conceive and takes as a, as a token, uh, he, w he was going to, to reward her for the services rendered with a, 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 ewe, a ewe lamb. And so he didn't have one so she just took this standard, a sta his staff, as, as, as a token so that when he could repay her, well she disappears. Uh, and then when she, uh, of course, as time progresses, it's clear she's, she's uh, pregnant. 
And so they're going to punish her as an adulteress or as a harlot, right? Well, she presents this, this standard to Judah. Look, this is your son. And, of course, his says that you're more righteous than I, you know, for I didn't fulfill my obligation. Okay, at any rate, um, um, the idea being that, that in the sin of Tamar, David came through from that pathway, from that bloodline, okay? That uh, having done that, that that prohibited up to ten generations, as, as Adam brings out, that uh, they were not allowed to go into the temple, okay, to worship, because that was, that was prohibited by God. And that at David being the tenth generation was then again allowed to go into the temple. And so that's where he brings up the other psalm regarding, uh, I, I was glad when they said unto me, let us enter into the, the house of the Lord. Okay, so he, he was, apparent, it was, it's possible that David was the first generation that was allowed to go back into the temple after Tamar. Okay, and that's what you're speaking of. So in a way, this, this might reflect that, behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me, going back to Tamar. Okay, so that's perhaps an explanation about this. But, but, he's, it's, he's, but he's making the point that in a world of sin, I was conceived. Okay. Or, or, or the other, like I said, regarding referring to Tamar. But he goes on to verse 6. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. So here it's revealing it. What does God want from us? What does God want from us? What do you think, Garrett, from this passage, from this verse? When Jesus says, when Jesus, uh, what am I, Sorry, when David writes, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, what's he mean? Does you think he wants you to, to lie to him? Does he want you to tell you, him the truth? From the very soul, right? They're very inward parts. You think that? Okay. Okay. I think that's, that's what he's saying. God wants us to be completely honest. And in completely, being completely honest with God, what's happening? Are we being completely honest with ourselves? Are we? If we're being completely honest with God, are we being completely honest with ourselves? Because we have to admit things to, to ourselves. David had to admit to himself, I sinned. You know, many times, people find, that's probably one of the hardest things that people find in repentance admitting to themselves they've done wrong. And in admitting to themselves, they say, now I can approach God and say, yes, look what I've done. He knows, of course. But we can, when we admit it to God... Well, even groups like the AA group and stuff, they tell you that acknowledgement is the first step. Okay. Because until somebody acknowledges that they're an alcoholic or that they're a drug user, you know, that they're addicted... Mm -hmm. That's right. So until the person acknowledges within themselves that I have a problem, mm -hmm. there will never be change. There will never be, nothing can be done. That's probably, what, half the battle? Acknowledging you've got a problem? And that goes for not just Alcoholics Anonymous. Right. Anything, anything that we have having to deal with in our lives, a change of, of a bad habit, we have to admit that, hey, I've got a bad habit. You know, I've got to stop. You know, uh, Snapping my fingers all the time, you know. <laughs> so even some people even say things like, you know, I don't want to talk about it, or I don't want to, whatever, because they don't want, if they talk about it, then that means acknowledging to someone else that there's a problem. That what's really going on is the battle that the spirit yeah. of God is going on in their heart between what's right and wrong. Yeah. So to discuss it with somebody means actually taking stock of what, what you're struggling it's with. It's causing one to confront right. what, what an issue is. Who? You probably don't know him. Okay. He used to attend here. Okay. He went to Brown Brownfield School of Reading. And he was an alcoholic, nearly towards the end of the park. But he got better and he became a strong he's okay. a very strong person. Okay. You gotta conf that you gotta deal with it.
talk to you about it, I have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And she didn't want to yeah. talk, she wasn't ready to deal with it. Okay. So, you know, I think, that, and that's, you know, when you talk about, when it says, um, we desire truth in the inward parts, you know, we got to be. That's our soul. Thing, yeah. So. <clears throat> so I think he says, so the Father desiring truth in our inward parts requires that in our inward parts we're, we're honest with ourselves too. And so in being honest with God, when we consider going to Father in prayer, are, are we 100% honest with him? Do we, do we really tell him uh, the truth about what's going in our mind? goes both ways, doesn't it? Lies, right? Yeah. That we, that when we, what we say to ourselves, our psyche believes, and it begins to believe the more it's said. So, you know, we have to acknowledge the truth, even to the point of, I am worth something. I am somebody to God. I am something important. Even though, yes, I've done these things, and I'm, and I'm, I'm, sor I'm sorrowful for that, but I can change. There's different aspects you just brought up. Just a whole slew of stuff. Sorry, but I Never. could just see David sitting there thinking, how could you forgive me? But he know he has to acknowledge in his heart, too, within mm -hmm. his inner heart, mm -hmm. the truth, and that is that God wills. He loves him. Well, you know, what's the biggest lot? You know, you talk about Satan and his, his ways. Satan uses so many different devices to render us inept. Inept? That's not the right word. Ineffective. And part of that is lies about ourselves. Like, I'm no good. I'm a sinner to the core. I was born a sinner. There's no way I can reach up to God. And that's a lie of all lies. So the fact is, God reaches toward us. And how valuable am I? How va we just discussed how valuable our souls are this morning. And that God sacrificed his son. Jesus died on the cross for us. So that we don't have to. We don't die. At all, although that's what's required of us. And yet, so Christ gave so much for us. So how valuable are we? We're that valuable to God to do that for us. To where the creator, Jesus before it was Jesus, yeah, the creator came to the earth and became our servant. That's how much he loves us, so how important are we? Very. So the thought that we are no good, uh, there's no way that God will save me. In fact, I'm so bad that I can't even find my way out of, you know, find, reach up to God and find, find forgiveness. That's, that's a big lie that renders us ineffectual if we believe that lie, that self-lie. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. That's right. That's right. First John one nine. <laughs> okay. Okay. So and he goes on to write, Purge me with hyssop. And I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Of course he's using figurative language here. Cleanse, uh, purge me with hyssop. You know what hyssop is? Hyssop is a plant that grows, grew up on the walls in, in Jerusalem, grew up on the rocks in, there, in that area. It is a spongy-like plant. 
And they would use that in the, in the old law as they would dip this hyssop, it was like a sponge. They'd hip, dip it in the blood of a lamb. It's, it'd actually consecrate the, the implements, the, the tabernacle, the implements of the tabernacle, the priests and their, clothes, their garments, all this, they would sprinkle the blood of the lamb on all these to consecrate them uh, for the service to the Lord, right? And so as David is using this figure uh, of speech, you know, um, purge me with hyssop, okay? Wash me, um, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Think about, I think about Jesus when, in the upper room when he was going to show his disciples a good example. He was going to teach his disciples a lesson they would never forget. When he got up from the table, he, uh, he, um, he gir I can't think of the term. What did he do? Girded his loins. He tied his robe up around his legs so they wouldn't get, get his robe all wet and messed up. And he got, and he wa he got the wash bowl, he got the, the, the towel, and he, he began to wash the disciples' feet. And Peter said, what? What are you doing? Are you washing my feet? Peter, Peter was probably the most shocked at all. He said, here you are, master, my, our master, and you're washing our feet, you're serving us like this? Don't wash my feet. But what did Jesus say? You'll have no part with me. That's right. Of course, Jesus washing us with his blood but, but he was teaching his disciples about servitude, the attitude of serving one another. Okay? But it, as it was, that he was washing their feet, and of course it was symbolic. In, uh, well, actually it was about uh, sh uh, teaching them about serving one another. Okay? Um, but but as, as David says, here, wash me that I may be as white as snow. Whiter than snow, I said. Make me hear to, to hear the joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. David was in such deep remorse. It was no fun so much. He, he probably didn't have a single chuckle in all this time. No joy. Um, it says, make me to hear joy and gladness. Bones thou hast broken may rejoice. Of course, the bones were his own bones. Of course, it had God broken his bones literally? No. But it's all, this is now figurative speech in the effect that this grievous sin has done, that he's carrying this around, and now he's confessing his sins to the Father. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. That's it. Mm -hmm. and not right. Of course, as we consider the law of God, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill. Okay, and here he committed those things. Of course, that's grievous to him. You have him carry this, this uh, guilt around with him. So, it says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. So he was... He was uh, Full of remorse, it was it was uh, killing him. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. That's an interesting thought. Um, um, he was not wanting to lose his relationship with the Father, with God. Um, Yeah, I, th I think that uh, one lives in sin long enough and, or, or doesn't repent of sin long enough that uh, um, he's forfeiting a, a, a close relationship with God. When one is not honest with God, when one is dishonest with God, when go, one thinks that he can go around and, and, and fool God, and, and full, of course, he can fool others. But uh, carrying around this guilt with him, and and not, and you know, 
Our, remember, it's our sins that have separated us from our God. Our iniquities have separated us from our God. And holding on, whether we continue in sin or whether we have sinned once and, and, don't, and don't confess it, that will separate us from God. And I think that's what he's saying. saying uh, Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. You know, he wants to retain a relationship with God. He doesn't want to just throw it all away. And he says, when he restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and hope me with thy free spirit. He's wanting the relationship that he once had, that uh, apparently he's, he's lost. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. So, <laughs> in restoring a good relationship with the Father again, with God, and he says, I will then will I teach transgressors thy way. So, you know, when, when you're in sin and you haven't confessed sin and you're, and you're living with the guilt of it, how effective can you be with others? How encouraging can you be with others? How can you teach others about sin? So there are a lot of things that we give up when we're, we're not honest with God and we don't seek his forgiveness. Deliver me from my blood guiltiness. That's the, the murder of Uriah. O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. So in delivering from the blood guiltiness, that is, having forgiven David of his sins, that he can then sing aloud of, his, of God's righteousness. Okay. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. <clears throat> Did God command the, mur the, the sacrifices? Did he command burnt offerings? Did God delight in burnt offerings? It is his commandments. They were to take their, their uh, sacrifices in the, to the priests at the tabernacle and, and they make their sacrifices. So it did delight, but there was something that was preventing any sacrifices that David could make that would please God. What was that? Isaiah chapter 1. Beginning in verse 2, for the thought, the nation of Judah, or actually um, Israel, had turned away from God. And as, as Isaiah writes, he writes, Hear, O heavens, give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know. My people doth not consider. God's chosen people didn't even recognize God. That they, they had turned their back away from God. And as you look at the, the dumb animals, the ox and the ass, they know their masters. They know the, who, to whom they belong. But God's people didn't know. They didn't consider it. Verse 4, Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seat of evildoers, children that are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Why should ye be stricken in any more? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. Uh, God had, uh, had stricken them with, with uh, various things to try to get them to wake up, that they had turned their back on God, but yet they continued in their sins, their iniquities. And why should he strict, stricken them anymore? It, uh, it won't result in any improvement in behavior. They'll just go on in their merry way. Um, verse 7, your countryside is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers devour it in your presence. And it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. All these things God allowed to happen. And it wasn't waking them up. They, they still went on in rejecting God. The daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. So uh, they were 
uh, pretty much that their whole spiritual life was left alone. Uh, let's see. And verse 9, except the Lord of hosts had left a, unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom and, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. What did God do to Sodom and Gomorrah? He obliterated them so much that we don't even know for sure where it was. We have ideas, but we don't know. And so, except that God had left a remnant that, of believers and those who were obedient to him, they would have been completely annihilated. Uh, here's the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom, give ear unto the law of God, ye people of Gomorrah. Um, and verse 11, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me? Why are you giving me all these sacrifices? Here your hearts are so far away from me, why do you even bother to give me sacrifices, saith the Lord? I am full of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of the land of, the, of, the he, of he goats. He wasn't accepting their sacrifices. It was he who had commanded them to do it, but at this point he wasn't accepting their sacrifices. It says in verse 12, When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at the, your hand to tread my courts? Well, God had, except that their hearts were so far away. Bring no more vain oblations. They were vain oblations. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. So their iniquities were to such an extent, and they were so blinded by it, they were not turning back to God, even though he had given them uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the countryside being desolated as it was, uh, ransacked, and they were still not turning to God. And because of their iniquities and not turning back to him, God didn't like their sacrifices. He didn't want them. It was false. It was vain. And, uh, and even when they would pray, he would turn his face from them. That's the state to which they had uh, sunken. And uh, which God was so angry with them for. And why he would reject them. Because they had rejected him. Okay. Now we turn back to uh, the Psalm 51. As David wrote... Uh, for thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. It's because of his iniquities that God would not delight in the sa whatever sacrifices David, David could give. Oh, Saul, so, yeah. That's not what he really wants. Yeah. He wants, because all the things that we do, it's, it's, they, yes, they, they, they are expressions of what should be going on inside. But if it's not what's going on inside, then it's, it's, a, it's a lie. It's hypocrisy. Um, uh, the sacrifices of God, verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O oh God, thou wilt not despise. So God, when it's due, when it's appropriate, we should have that, the, that broken spirit. We should have that contrite heart. I think when, when Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, those who have the attitude that 
that they need God. They, they stand before God with sin and iniquities. That, that broken spirit, they're blessed in. Why? Because that prepares them for what they, to do what they must do to be satisfied, to be satisfactory to God. Just as David needed to repent of his sins to be satisfactory with God. Because that's when God can, can, can forgive, is when we have that contrite heart. It's in verse, uh, and that broken and contrite heart, God will not despise. That's what he wants when it's appropriate to do. Do good in thy pleasure unto Zion, build thou the walls of Jerusalem, then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering, then shall they with offer bullocks upon thine altar. So David understood he needed to make amends with God. He needed to seek his forgiveness with, before God, co confess his sins to God for what he had done. And then God would accept the sacrifices that he can offer. Then would God be pleased with those sacrifices. And so it is, as we consider the example of David in, in appealing to God for, for forgiveness and confessing his sins and being honest with God about ourselves. That no matter, I mean, when we come together to assemble and worship God with, in truth and in spirit, singing songs, hymns, spiritual songs, encouraging one another, the blessings that we, we would seek and to find in the assembling with the saints, they can't be had unless we are as David was, the contrite spirit, the poor, poor in spirit, and, and honest with God. That's any thoughts or questions? Or? Okay. And technically we have three more minutes before I stop early. <laughs> that's the lesson. And we can, we can, we can continue on to discuss, but I, that, that's what I really want to discuss. Well, there is more I do have, but it has to deal with more of a, the, the hardened heart, the conscience, the seared conscience. And that's, you know, it, it prevents people from doing what God wants. Remember when Pharaoh, when Moses came to Pharaoh with the, with the demands of God to let his people go, sometimes the Bible says God hardened his heart. Sometimes it said Moses hardened his heart. Sometimes it said Pharaoh hardened his own heart. The word of God uh, achieves what God intends. Unfortunately, men will harden their hearts to what God demands of them. And Pharaoh was an example where he hardened his heart because God made demands of him, and he didn't want to, he didn't want to acknowledge God as the creator, you know. Some, but uh, that's an example of hardened hearts. And I'll stop there. Thanks for, I thought the discussion was very good today. I appreciate the comments and questions. Look forward to next week. Thanks.